Hey everybody, welcome to What the Flick's Christmas Countdown. I'm Alonzo Duraldi. that's Dave White, my co-host on the Linoleum Knife Podcast. For the first 25 days of December, we're going to be bringing you some favorite holiday movies, many of which are featured in my book, Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas. And if we didn't get to the ones you like, it's probably in Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas, now available from Amazon. Unless it came out after 2010. Yes. Which was which, the publication date correct. of Have Yourself a Movie Little Christmas. In which case, in some cases, we're trying to catch up on it now. <laughs> uh, but this one is going to be about a classic. It's in the book. It's it's in our hearts. It's 1954's White Christmas uh, featuring the song that uh, Bing Crosby made famous uh, in the 30s, or sorry, in the 30s, 40s? 40s. 40s movie, Holiday Inn, uh, which we'll get to in a second, but take a look. Bing and Danny are bringing you a bonus of holiday cheer early this year with the music, the magic of one of the greatest entertainment hits of all time. Bing and Danny in a joyous show business story of a couple of guys who have made good and now want to make better. You've got everything you yes, want, I'm except loaded. the most important thing. What's this? A girl. I'll get her out of that one of these days. My dear partner. When what's left of you gets around to what's left to be gotten, what's left to be gotten won't be worth getting whatever it is you've got left. So White Christmas was introduced in the uh, Irving Berlin musical Holiday Inn in the 1940s, uh, which starred Bing Crosby and Fred Astaire. Introduced and in film. In film. It had already been. Oh, it was already released as a single? Uh, he sang it on the radio for ah, the very okay. first time on December 25th, 1941, oh. three weeks after Pearl Harbor. Gotcha. Yeah. That all makes sense. Yeah. So Holiday Inn is a lovely movie in its own right, except for the part where it's Lincoln's birthday and they do a number in blackface, Bing Crosby included. So Historically um, important, otherwise. Dodgy. Yeah. Uh, so yeah, so you don't see Holiday Inn so much on TV because of that. But you do see White Christmas, which uh, is also in color, and instead of Fred Astaire, you've got Danny Kay. Uh, but the song White Christmas uh, has a key role in American pop culture and I think in the existence of this movie. Uh, Irving Berlin ran into his uh, transcription secretary's office one day, and he said, I have written the best song I have ever written. I have written the best song anybody has ever written. And he was not wrong, <laughs> because that song became uh, the biggest selling record of the 20th century. Yeah. <laughs> and there's a reason. It's a Christmas song that is melancholy. Yes. It's about longing it's about and longing, and it takes, it 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 taps into the inherent sadness that people often feel at Christmas time, and I won't say it exploits that. It just it gives that a boost inside yeah. you and makes you. It's kind of like eating a potato chip. If potato chips are sadness, you just want to keep eating more <laughs> sadness, and. In spite of the giant bombastic versions that people record, like it's like some triumphant, you know, march to victory, it's actually a very sad song. Hence, it became incredibly popular with soldiers, uh, American soldiers, in World War II. And the film capitalizes on this uh, really effectively by front-loading the movie with the song at the very beginning, where Bing Crosby playing Essentially, a version of himself is singing the song to the troops. Cut to the troops. On the battlefield. Cut to the troops. They're weeping. Yes. And at the end of the movie, once they've saved the, saved the ski lodge and the, the big show has happened and everyone's fallen in love and they're all going to get married and everyone's dressed in these scorchingly red <laughs> costumes, they sing it again as a, as a, as a, as a, as a marker of communal joy. Not so much a, a, a moment of nostalgia, even though it is uh, referring back to the war that they all fought together and they are all there to help a general that they loved during the war, but as a way forward rather than an occasion for missing something. Yeah. So if White Christmas during World War II was a way for soldiers to think back about the home fires and the, 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 the loved ones they left behind, the movie White Christmas is sort of their nostalgia for World War II. Yes. That song reminds them of having been in World War II, and this is a movie about people in the 50s 
figuring out what their lives after the war is going to be. And, um, you know, there's even a song toward the end, Gee, I Wish I Was Back in the Army, where Irving Berlin really kind of celebrates the notion of having been a soldier, having been a GI, having fought in World War II. And you see the eagerness of these people to come together to help out their old general, to reunite at Christmas time. Uh, you know, ties into this sort of intricate post-war nostalgia, even though obviously the war itself was, you know, horrifying. But it was 1954, and we were right smack in the middle of the Cold War, which is such an uncertain right. moment and such a frightening moment for people in the 1950s. Uh, if you're as, facing nuclear holocaust, some, some, suddenly yeah. being back, you know, in Bataan seems, you know, maybe well, a little... Well, maybe not Bataan, but, okay. uh, but the, the, the idea of the good war that we all won together, right. that we all pulled together for and won together, versus this vague hovering threat of a giant nuclear bomb over us, which right. is kind of, that, that, that was part of the 1950s that you know, people don't often talk about very much anymore. They talk about how you know, cool everything looked, and it really <laughs> did look cool back then. Yes. You know, the post-war design is some of the most gorgeous Stuff that we've got to this day is the reason mid-century modern furniture is still popular. <laughs> right, and so that this film takes a lot of advantage uh, of 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 that sort of gorgeous, you know, at the time contemporary <laughs> uh, scenery. It stars, like we said, Bing Crosby, Danny Kaye <laughs> as a, a song and dance team. They're famous guys, right? And they meet a sister act played by Rosemary Clooney and Vera Ellen, and they all together decide they're going to help this general by performing a big show that's gonna air on Christmas Eve on television. From his inn at Vermont that is yeah. suffering because it's not snowing and so he's not getting the ski trade in. Meanwhile, they all fall in love and have misunderstandings and sing, 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 yeah. sing. This is a movie that was, you know, it, it's funny, uh, there were so many reviews about Bad Mom's Christmas that complained that, oh, this is only 15 months since the last one and they obviously threw this together for a cash grab. This movie was written in a month. Like, they were literally writing the script while sets were being designed and costumes were being sewn. They brought, they had, they had Norman Krasman originally come in, but then they brought in the two guys who had just written a Danny Kay vehicle called Knock on Wood, and they just cranked this baby out. Yeah. Uh, it's worth noting the director is Michael Curtiz, who also directed Casablanca, another movie that was sort of being written on the fly as it was being shot. Uh, famously, Ingrid Bergman, for most of the shoot, didn't know who she was going to get on the airplane with. Right. Um, so this is not a movie that you're seeing for the script necessarily, but no, the, 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 uh, come on, the story is really the story is pretty ridiculous. It, you but, want to see people fall in love and yes. sing songs. The musical numbers are great. This is Rosemary Clooney's first movie, and she is incredibly warm and affectionate and maternal. And when she and Bing Crosby sing "Count Your Blessings," you know it is just one might weep, perhaps, um, even if one normally does not weep during films. <laughs> Uh, I'm but, not naming names, but that person's initials are Dave Way. <laughs> so you've got you've got great Irving Berlin songs. You have uh, the incredible dance mastery of uh, Vera Ellen, um, and this this movie. Hang on, you're not giving her enough cred. Okay. Stop right there. All right, sorry. She was impeccable. Yes, she was meticulous. She was a machine of dancing. Maybe not such a great actress. Who gives a damn? She moves like a non-human thing <laughs> in this film. There's a tap scene in this movie where she is tapping so fast, you think that it's a robot that's doing this, <laughs> but in reality, she never stopped practicing. <laughs> She never stopped rehearsing. She was such a perfectionist. She does these somersaults craft. over other dancers yeah. that are just on downstairs <laughs> that are just amazing. For too long, she's gotten the short shrift when it comes to talking about this movie. People say, oh, we love Rosemary Clooney. Oh, Danny Kaye, he's so funny. Oh, Bing Crosby, what a legend. Oh, Vera Ellen, sure, she's nice. No, she's the unsung hero of this film. Worship her. <laughs> Also, uh, Mary Wicks, character actress, you know her from Sister Act and yeah. countless other movies. She is always a great scene stealer. Yeah, um, yeah this, this is just uh, the kind of movie where uh, they, you know, they had this in immensely popular song. They sort of leaned into why it was immensely popular and built a movie around it. So that's why I keep predicting that one of these days, Mariah Carey is going to make a movie called All I Want for Christmas is You. Didn't she already? She has a TV special this year, that animated thing, which is about a girl and a puppy and whatever. Doesn't count. No, I think she's, <laughs> she is saving her chits 
for a feature film that's going to be like White Christmas to like exploit how much that song has become kind of the new White Christmas in a way. Will she be in it like in Glitter? Oh, please. Well, <laughs> only, okay, she can be in it if she plays Mrs. Claus. That could work. Or Santa. She could be she Santa. She could be Santa. Mariah she's the, could be she's Santa. The she can yeah. do anything she wants. She's the queen of Christmas. And, you know, look, uh, yes, it's we, Glitter is still hilarious, but she was really good and precious. Let's not forget. That's, let's not. Um, so, yeah, White Christmas. Uh, also the first film to be shot in VistaVision, which was Paramount's attempt to get on the... Was it also uh, the last film shot in no, VistaVision? No, 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 no. They no? used it for a while. No? Okay. Uh, in fact, Curtiz used it again the following year to make another Christmas movie, Where No Angels, with uh, oh. Humphrey Bogart and Aldo Ray yeah. and Peter Ustinov. Also very cool. Uh, yeah, VistaVision was Paramount's attempt to kind of get on the CinemaScope bandwagon, and it was uh, it basically the film ran through the camera sideways so they could make it as wide as they wanted. Uh, if uh, you've, you've seen White Christmas, come on! If you are if, if you're an American, you've probably seen White Christmas, and if you haven't, this would be the year to do it. It's on Netflix. It, Go check it, it out. I watch it every year, sometimes twice. Like once just to have on while I'm baking stuff because I'm always baking stuff. Um, and then once, like, to sit down, and we're lucky because we live in Los Angeles. Yeah, we get to see it projected. We can see it on a screen pretty much anywhere in the city yeah. at, at that time. But if not, it's on Netflix right now. Take that, Hallmark now. Movies. Los Angeles <laughs> is cool. <laughs> Thanks for watching. Uh, we'll be back tomorrow with more Christmas Countdown.